There are consistent themes when it comes to interview answer mistakes. And we are going to dive right in with a screen share today. I actually want to drive you towards the free resources I have on my website. And then we're going to dive into both of those Google Docs to show you how to improve your answers. So let's do it. So if you go to practiceinterviews.com, you scroll to the bottom of our page, you'll see free resources down here. And then when you open up free resources, you'll see both a behavioral answers and hypothetical answers template. Let's go into each. Let's start with behavioral answers. So what are the common mistakes that people make when answering behavioral questions? Let's dive into every single item. So role and company. Why is it a challenge when we don't introduce this? It's credibility. You're likely working in a like role, maybe at another large company, another startup. Establish credibility right away. We cannot guarantee that our interviewers review our resumes. Then the relevant details. People have no challenge providing details, but let's make sure that they're relevant. So what does that mean? Details that an interviewer could quickly understand to understand the context and your story. Think two to three sentences. You're going to have to rework this multiple times, but make sure the details are relevant to answering the question. Lots of times they're irrelevant and that pulls away from our story. It doesn't add value. And then just for the task, what is your responsibility? If there's something specific that you need to call out, but the timeline's really helpful. I don't know if it took you a day, a week, a month, a year. State the timeline. It will provide additional value for your interviewer. Okay, let's get into the actions. So we typically want to start off with research, planning, conversations, data gathering, whatever it might be. This is an area that most candidates don't miss. They do fine. They introduce those details, but just make sure the biggest mistake here is I don't have clarity into how you did it. So if you did research, how'd you go about it? If you had conversations, who did you have them with? What did that look like, et cetera? And how did you start to come up with that plan? People usually focus on this area. Now, as we scroll into actions, execution and testing is probably one of the biggest missing pieces of the puzzle. Oftentimes, after those conversations, we actually have to test to see if the solution will work and then execute. And people just simply seem to skip over the execution part. Get into the weeds of what you did. That's going to tell me about how you handle the situation and ultimately drive me towards those great results. And a lot of times, even with a conflict, we are testing. We're testing to see how we can build that relationship. Testing is much more common than we think. So think about how did you roll out a sample, a use case, something small before diving all the way in. Then is our roundup. A lot of times we don't talk about how we presented, launched, and documented things. Those items are all very, very important. I want to know how the launch went. I want to know how you documented, and I want to know how you presented, rolled it up to leadership. That is probably one of the most common areas that's left out. And let's just double down into documentation for a second. That's legacy. Right, So when you leave, that documentation could be really important for future programs, projects, initiatives, etc. Now, as we get into the results, number one, we have to tie the results back to the question that was asked of us. That's pretty common that people don't actually tie it back to the actual question. That's a common mistake. Quantifying and qualifying, numbers are the universal language. So we're always going to want to quantify and qualify. And then repeatability. This is the bigger win. So sometimes you build a relationship with one client and that process or strategy is used with 10 clients. You just build a more generic strategy or process and that was shared across multiple departments within the organization. Repeatability, it's such a big mistake to not introduce that because that shows the broader impact of what you did and it's the last thing you say. These are some of the most common items I see on the behavioral side. Let's flip over to the hypothetical side. So on the hypothetical side, well, not going in with a method or a plan is very, very common, but let's assume you know a little bit about the method and the plan. Starting off with clarification, we have to clarify the question. 
typically hypothetical questions are going to have massive amounts of ambiguity. So we just want to identify what are those ambiguities. That could be chopping into the words. That could be chopping into more generic themes. One or two questions probably isn't enough. Three to five is going to be right in that nice wheelhouse. But the biggest item and the biggest mistake I see people making is asking very open-ended questions to hypothetical questions. That's forcing your interviewer to use their brain. We don't want them to do that. We want to make it as simple as possible. So an analogy might be, do you, what do you like better, cookies or cake? Right? And you just say, oh, cake, because it's such an easy answer. So if we ask a question like, are the stakeholders internal, external, or both? Oh, they're both. You make it very, very easy on your interviewer to answer. So think simplistically, either or, yes or no questions. That is going to be a huge game changer. And it's just a common mistake that people ask clarifying questions that are very open-ended. Now, as we move on to the framework, a couple of the biggest mistakes and common challenges I see with the framework are, well, first of all, it's just completely ignored. Second of all, tons of context. So we talk about something like goals and objectives, and somebody might state goals and objectives, you know, long term, short term, we got to be thinking about all those goals. And it's, it's simply goals and objectives. We're just trying to create a very simplistic outline of the areas we want to concentrate and focus on. So again, not presenting and then too much context are really areas where it gets tough. And then sometimes it's just a framework solution. It's just an expansion on all the framework concepts and then all the other parts are forgotten. So just make sure you're briefly revealing concepts that are critical to answering the question and that will help you do great on the framework part. Assumptions. The biggest mistake here is not using them. Creating visuals for our audience keeps them engaged and allows them to picture what we're talking about. I'm going to use lots of analogies on the hypothetical side. So what happens without this is that we're mostly talking about food. It's generic. We all like food, but we can't picture it. Talk about pepperoni pizza. Bring in some very, very specific assumptions. And of course, we want them to be role specific. But if your interviewer cannot picture what you're solving for, it's a common mistake. We think interviewers have a good attention span. They don't. So if you give them specific details, it's going to allow them to attach more closely to your solution. And why it's a common mistake is if you don't create specific assumptions, your solutions are going to be incredibly generic, also making it harder for you to come up with a more specific solution. So let's dive just into the solution component for a moment. The biggest and most common mistake in the solution, there's really two. One, the solutions are very generic. I'm going to talk to the critical stakeholders. We're going to come up with a plan. We're going to execute on that plan. We're going to launch, and it's all going to go fantastic. Well, that's really tricky, right? So what we want to do is we want to get really specific. So we're trying to bring in our solution and get to those specific details. How do we do that? By tying them back to the assumptions. And that's the second common mistake is sometimes even if we make good assumptions, we're not tying the solution back to those assumptions. And therefore, the assumptions carry no weight. They had no value. And then the last piece is trying to solve for everything. We really want to try and solve for a couple of framework concepts at a time. The frameworks are outline. It tells our interviewer, hey, we know what we're talking about, but trying to solve from A to Z, well, we'll probably lose them, and trying to solve for everything means we're not going to be able to get specific enough. This is a super high-level video, but these themes happen all the time. I want you to utilize both these documents at practiceinterviews.com to really help you craft great answers. If you follow these structures, you will do fantastic in your interviews. Good luck.